Okay, so I'll start. Um, I'm Laura Hubner. I am a postdoc in the group uh, working on Alice. I work on jets and jet substructure. Hi, um, I'm Yochi. I'm a uh, so rising third year grad student. Um, work on star and uh, jets and PP and jet substructure. I'm Michael, a very uh, recent graduate and currently a uh, postdoc here. Uh, I'm there, summer student. Well, you know me, I'm home and I'm um, finishing up my uh, FCR. And uh, I'm already at a point where I don't want to say in which year I'm starting. <laughs> uh, that, that's like pulling things from one day before you skip them. So, yeah. I might still need to say this for a while. <laughs> but yeah, I'm working on um, P Gold and uh, ISOR uh, chart, uh, chart paper on spectrum. Nice to meet you, Ben. I'm Kevin. I'm arriving second year, and I think that uh, Michael will be starting this. Oh, hi. You know me, I'm Raga, postdoc on Star Jets. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm Annalise. Um, I'm going to be a fifth year and also Jets. Hi, I'm John. I work on Star Jets. Hi, I'm Jeff. I work on Star Jets. Hi, I'm Jeff. I work on Star Jets. Maybe Andrew. Oh, well, Amber is also here too. So, uh, and uh, we, uh, Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself very quickly? Oh, hi. Uh, we talked earlier. I'm Andrew. I'm a first year grad student working on uh, energy, energy correlators. Sierra. Yeah, hi, we met earlier, but I'm Sierra. I'm a first year graduate student in Elise working on PID and JETS. And burn. Oh, he's still connecting on. Uh, he's on one, and then he's connecting to another. So maybe. Um. Burn. Are you there? Yes. Sorry, I had a little trouble calling in, but uh, I managed. No, no worries. We were just introducing all, uh, all introducing ourselves to Ben, so he knows who. Ah, uh, uh, hi, Ben. Um, and this is Ben Mueller. I'm uh, back at Duke after spending the spring semester on, on sabbatical at the Wright Lab. Sorry to miss you, <laughs> but um, I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, right, and I don't think Mozart is there yet, so I think we'll just start. I'll introduce you really quick, and then we can. Tara, you want to start with that one? Which one? This one. Oh, yes. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Huh. All right. Okay. So today, um, oh, um, um okay. So uh, to. Today we have Ben Kimmelman, um, who is from UC Davis. He's currently finishing his working on finishing his PhD at UC Davis. Uh, ben is a member of the Star uh, Collaboration, and his re research focus is on high K high on K on proton spectra analysis um, at the lowest center mass energy of three uh, GeV array uh, to study the QC phase diagram. Um, in addition to physics analysis, he developed the star QA board to improve the star quality of assurance procedure. Um, and he uh, worked on the you know, board gap state charge correction and stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, and so today, uh, Ben will be talking about phase uh, transitions and their climate, uh, probing the QCD phase jargon for the anguishes. And so, yeah, please uh, go ahead and start. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me here today. Um, 
as we said, uh, my talk is titled Phase Transitions and Where to Find Them, Probing the QCD Phase Diagram with Heavy Ion Collisions. Um, so I'll start off with a discussion of the physics of uh, the QCD phase diagram, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the quark gluon plasma, as well as some of the sort of historical measurements over the past 20 plus years of uh, RIC is um, what I'm going to be mostly focusing on. Um, we'll then go on to a discussion about the facilities, uh, focusing again on Rick and the start uh, experiment, and then we'll move on to a discussion of the charge cathode spectra at 3 GeV, which is the analysis I work on, and we'll talk about how that relates to some of these uh, open questions um, that we're trying to answer in the meeting. So with heavy ion collisions, as I think most of us here are familiar with, we take our ions and accelerate them to various relativistic velocities. Um, as, or when they collide, we create a QGP uh, by breaking apart the nucleons, and that is the red in this animation here. And as the uh, system expands and cools, we create hadrons, uh, which we, at some much later time, measure. Now, what is a quark gluon plasma? This is sort of the center of heavy ion physics. Uh, at the moment, is understanding properties of it. Uh, well, normal nuclear matter behaves like that of gas. Um, and so we use an ideal gas like type equation of state to describe it. And normally, we have quarks and gluons that are bound together into hadrons, which we can see sort of in the foreground. Uh, when we Collider ions at sufficiently high energy, we uh, uh, have a phase transition into a quark gluon plasma from this hadron gas. Now, the quarks and gluons are no longer bound together into hadrons, they are free to move around and interact with each other. You can see more in the background in this uh, image. And the other important feature is we really have a different equation of state for the system in this QDP phase. We use a 3D icing model. Uh, to describe the system. And just like our normal Ison model that we think of in terms of spins, where you have this coupling between spin up and spin down uh, particles, we get the same sort of thing in this 3D Ison model, but instead of uh, it spins with quark and antiquark. So we form these quark antiquark dipoles or mesons. Now, what are some signatures of the quark gluon plasma? And we'll look back to actually 2005 when uh, the four experiments at Brookhaven National Lab, uh, Phobos, Star, Phoenix, and Brahms, published white papers indicating measurements that were very consistent with uh, the expectations of quark gluon plasma. Now, they did, however, uh, say in each of their papers that this was not definitive proof of the measurement of the QGP. Uh, there were still open questions that needed to be answered at this time to really consider these uh, observations as definitive proof of the QGP. Um, but this is sort of where the field started, well, where these really intense investigations into QGP started. And uh, these four white papers were compiled in this Hunting the Quark Balloon Plasma Report. Uh, that was released by Brookhaven National Lab. Now, we'll take a look at two observables. Uh, the first, we're going to start with uh, one from STAR, and we'll start actually at the top right here, where we see a cartoon of a PP collision, where we have two partons that are being scattered back to back, which then hadronize into jets. If we go to the bottom right, we have the same thing, but in an AA collision, but in this case, we are creating a quark gluon plasma, which one of these partons has to travel through, and the idea is these hadrons will be suppressed. Now, what we have on the left here is a dihadron azimuthal correlation, basically looking at the correlation between two hadrons in azimuth. If we look at zero in all three data sets, PP, D gold, and gold gold, we see a peak indicating that hadrons that are moving in the same direction are correlated with each other, which is not a surprise if you have a jet. If we look at uh, pi radians away, 
we would expect to see the same peak or a similar type of peak uh, due to the other jet that was uh, back to back. And we see that in the proton proton, we do our gold data, but not in the gold gold data, which is an indication that there is something preventing these jets from being measured uh, or produced in some way. And that is really all we can say from this measurement alone, that we don't see those jets in gold gold for some reason. We can also look at some other observables. In this case, we have uh, the nuclear modification factor, which can be constructed in a few different ways. Normally, we would like to compare the yields of our hadrons in uh, gold gold data or lead lead data to what we get in proton proton data, where we do a scaling that assumes that a proton or that a heavy ion collision is a superposition of some number of uh, proton proton collisions given by this average number of particles or average number of binary collisions. Now, we don't always have proton proton data set as a reference, so we uh, instead construct this RCP of ratio of central to peripheral collisions uh, because peripheral collisions are predicted to be very similar to proton proton collisions, and there have been measurements indicating that this is true. <clears throat> And so we scale both of these accordingly. And what we would expect is if uh, there were no QGP, our yields in heavy ion collisions would be the same as in proton proton collisions with this scaling implemented. And so we would expect to be at one for this ratio. But we clearly see we are less than one, particularly as we go to high PT. And this is an indication that we are seeing some. Uh, some suppression of hadrons in these central collisions compared to what we would expect. Now, these two are, uh, these are just two of the uh, measurements done by these uh, four experiments uh, from these white papers. There are a lot of others uh, that really help build up the case for UGP formation. Uh, however, these still were really not enough to be uh, to say definitively at that point in time that we had measured QPP. So the next step was to run a beam energy scan program where we changed the collision energy from 7.7 .7 up to 62.4 GeV. Now this was run uh, between 2010 and 2014 uh, when I believe the 14.5 data set was collected. And before we get too much into the physics of this program, I want to talk briefly about some of the features of this phase diagram. Um, first, we have this blue line for chemical freeze out, which is when the inelastic collision cease. So the momentum, or so the total particle yields are set. And then the red line is for kinetic freeze out when elastic collision cease and uh, momentum distributions are fixed. Now, lattice QCE prediction, or Calculations indicate then that a chemical potential of zero and a temperature of 154 MeV that there is a continuous phase transition, which means that there is no distinction between these two phases, the hadron gas, the quark balloon plasma. And predictions also indicate that this extends to a finite uh, chemical potential, uh, which is represented by this dashed orange line. Other QCD-based calculations indicate that there is a first-order phase transition at high baryon chemical potential, which is this solid uh, black line. And if we have a first-order phase transition that changes over to a continuous one, there has to be a critical point, which is this uh, yellow circle. Now, this is a cartoon. We don't know where this critical point is, although, as we'll see uh, shortly, there are some indications that it might be in this energy range around 7.7. So beam energy scan phase one was really designed to characterize the QCE phase diagram. And there were three main goals in this. The first was to probe the disappearance of QVP signatures. Next was to uh, search for the first sort of phase transition. And then finally, locate the critical point if it exists. And we'll now look at some of the measurements uh, relating to each of these. And I'll practice this by saying, there are a large number of measurements relating to each of these goals, and I've selected just a very small 
uh, amount of those um, that are really the most relevant to work that I've uh, been doing with the charge hydron spectra. Uh, we'll start by looking at the probes that is trans QGP signatures, and this is another RCP measurement. This was done by Stephen Horvath in his thesis uh, from Yale here a few years ago. Um, and what we see is at our highest energy of 62.4 GeV, we see a clear suppression, very similar to what we saw from that uh, Phoenix plot a couple of slides ago. And as we go to lower collision energy at 7.7, .7, we see this suppression really disappear and change to an enhancement. Now, there are a number of different possible explanations for this. Perhaps we create a QGP at these high collision energies and we don't have these low collision energies. Or perhaps we just create a larger volume at these high energies, uh, causing more suppression in a smaller volume at these lower energies. There are also a number of cold nuclear matter effects that play into this and could potentially cause this enhancement, something uh, like the Cronin effect. And with this observable alone, we really can't say anything definitive. There are some other ways in which we can investigate um, the same question uh, using slightly different observables and scaling these in some slightly different ways. Um, but from beam energy skin one, you really can't say definitively, particularly due to the limited statistics at our lowest energies, where we really only extend up to a PT of 3 GeV. Um, you really can't say much definitively about uh, the disappearance of these QGP signatures um, from this observable alone. How many events? This is a 7.7 GeV dataset. I don't know, and I would have to look so it up. Because the beam energy is 3.85, 3 and there's already a 3 GeV track with enough statistics from. That yeah. seems crazy compared to 64 GeV, and the maximum you can get to is 7 GeV. Um, I thought the maximum would be like two something kinematically, but you can hit a 3 GeV. PT from a three point something. GV. Right. So these are all mid rapidity measurements. So PZ is going to be zero. I mean, it's not a narrow bin, it's pretty wide bin on uh, mid rapidity. So it's not inherently zero, but it will be small. Um, okay. So if you have just a hard scattering event, you can get these higher PTs. Mm -hmm. Okay. You also, I think, get the boost from the four. Yeah. Easier to get the three. From and the this add one point. G, yeah. Rather than add one GEV on the end of the 62, like that. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, and this will look really long. So if you have two hard interactions, you can have coalescence of the charge. Coalescence between the wheels? I don't know. Two different parts like you. And all your three genomes here, they can sort of come together. You don't necessarily. Yeah, don't okay. But you're right, I mean, it's a reaction. So we can now look at uh, the first order phase transition, and this is really going to be the focus of uh, the discussion. With my work, I want to spend a little more time talking about this. And I have a cartoon of the temperature versus heat added diagram for the phase transition of ice into water into steam uh, that we can refer to. Um, so for first order phase transitions, the two phases have to be in thermal equilibrium. So we can imagine an ice cube floating in a glass of water, they're in thermal contact and they share thermal properties, meaning the temperature and pressure. Now, the Gibbs free energy has to be continuous across the phase transition, but its derivatives, particularly the volume and entropy, are discontinuous. And we can think of this in some intuitive way. We know that ice has a larger volume than liquid water. We also know that liquid water doesn't expand as it cools down. This is a feature of crossing that phase boundary. We have this discontinuity in the volume. There is a characteristic mixed phase uh, where the temperature and pressure are uh, constant, but the volume and entropy change. 
this is really the same as these first two points, but we have this intuition for a mixed phase where we have this coexistence between the two phases. So it's worth discussing this, or at least mentioning it. And we see this here where the uh, where we're transitioning from ice to water, we have this coexistence both and we're staying constant in temperature. And finally, there's a change in the degree of degrees of freedom of the system. If we look at ice, the water molecules are locked in a relatively rigid lattice, but when you uh, are in the liquid phase of water, they're able to move around and rotate more freely. So we could say we unlock rotational degrees of freedom, for example, uh, when going through this phase transition. Now, for the hadron gas and QGP phase transition, we're not talking about these types of degrees of freedoms or degrees of freedom. We're really talking about changing from hadron degrees of freedom to quark and gluon degrees of freedom. Now, let's look at some of the measurements uh, relating to this first order phase transition. And one I'll mention is uh, baryon stopping as our ions interact or as our ions collide, the uh, nucleons can interact and lose momentum in the longitudinal direction, which we measure with rapidity. And we can measure this rapidity loss, and there are some theoretical predictions that may indicate a dip in this trend of baryon stopping of this rapidity loss could be indicative of a softening equation of state in the first order phase transition. And if we look at some of these observables, uh, particularly in this AGS uh, energy region, we may see a suggestion of a dip, although there is some tension between different experiments and it's really hard to say anything definitive uh, at the moment about this. Um, but I'll talk more about stopping uh, later when we uh, talk about my analysis. Another uh, observable that we can look at is the flattening of the kinetic temperature and average radial velocity. Kinetic temperature is the temperature at kinetic freeze out when the momentum distribution are fixed. And what we see is uh, in this middle plot, as we go up in energy, we're rising and then our kinetic temperature just flattens out at these uh, red squares from being energy stand one. In a very similar way to how the temperature flattened out and stayed constant during the mixed phase of a first order phase transition from ice into liquid water. So this is a very suggestive that we may be in this mixed phase. Uh, similarly, if we look at the average radial velocity, which is discussing the expansion of the fireball, um, we see the same sort of flattening where we rise and then flat. Now, these are very interesting, but we also have relatively large error bars and a pretty decent gap in the data where you really don't know what's going on in a certain energy region. So while we have some suggestions that there may be a first sort of phase transition, we can't really say anything definitive at the moment about it. When was that paper published? The start of it? Um, this is from the bulk properties paper, so 2016. I found 17. it surprising that the star marker is used for world data. Yeah. And the I, star data is not in the star marker. I agree. I tend to use stars to represent yes. star data. Good. But um, <laughs> the <laughs> authors of this bulk properties paper did not do that. And I don't think there's anything in our bylaws about it. You can do whatever you want. We should do something. Yeah. <laughs> we need that. We can ask Fernando or institutional rep to introduce it. <laughs> the the important thing. Huh? <laughs> I don't care. Anyway, it looks nice. It looks, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so, deal with it. <laughs> so we can now look at uh, the search for the location of the critical point. Uh, so critical points exist at the end of a first order phase transition and at a critical point correlation length diverges. The correlation length is the length scale over which particles are correlated with each other. Normally, they would only be correlated with their nearest neighbors, but at a critical point, you can get much larger scale uh, correlation lengths. What we see here is, uh, um, 
is CO2 uh, starting in its uh, superfluid phase, which is above this critical point, and we see that the two phases are indistinguishable. As we cool the temperature just slightly, we see this flash of cloudiness, uh, which is a phenomenon called critical opalescence. The idea is the uh, correlation length is gotten so large that it's on the same length scale as uh, the wavelength of visible light. And so light will scatter through this normally transparent medium. So uh, we really see this divergence of the correlation length visually in this case. We can't look at our QGP with our eyes. It's too hot, too small, a lot of other things that aren't worth <laughs> spending time on. But we're looking in the end for this divergence in the correlation line, some non-monotonic trend that indicates that something is going on. And so what we do is look at the net proton higher moments. And we see if we start at high energy and move down, we start at some baseline, we dip down, we rise back up. And then if we include this point uh, from a hot A's, we dip back down again. So this is very suggestive of some non-monotonic trend. The issue is these low energy uh, measurements have very large uncertainties. So we really can't say anything with much certainty at all, uh, just due to these large uncertainties. Um, why are the error bars on the project? Okay, maybe you'll get, you'll get, I'll get to that. So the question is, we've done a bunch of these measurements through beam energy scan one. We really had a lot of evidence for the formation of a QGP. And so at the time that beam energy scan one ended, we were pretty set as a field that we are creating a QGP. Question is, what comes next? And the answer is a second or second phase of the beam energy scan. We selected the most important energies uh, in the range, which are from three up to 27 GeV, and this required the addition of a fixed target program that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And we needed to improve the significance of a lot of these measurements with higher statistics, because a number of these measurements were really just statistics limited. We also uh, have a number of detector improvements to really help improve our signal. And these are the inner time projection chamber upgrade and two new detectors, the NCAT time of flight and the event plane detector. Now, beam energy scan phase two of the data collection uh, took place between 2019 and 2021. And if we take a look back at the phase diagram from beam energy scan one, we see we really cover this region of the phase diagram. If we look for beam energy scan phase two, we can see we've really expanded it dramatically. With our fixed target program, we've added nine new energies below our previous lower limit of 7.7 .7 GeV. We've also added a number of new energies in our collider program to help add more points uh, in between our previous measurements to really give us the best uh, possibility of finding all of these observables that we've been looking for. So there are three main or four main goals of beam energy scan phase two. First is to identify the onset of QGP and deconfinement. Next is characterize the order of phase transition at high baryon chemical potential, establish the location of the critical point, and finally investigate, investigate symmetry restoration and the chiral phase transition. Now, these first three are pretty much the exact same goals as beam energy scan one. We made a lot of progress there, but we still had a lot of open questions that we needed higher statistics uh, to answer. And so that is one of the main goals of beam energy scan phase two is to hopefully definitively answer these questions. We also are uh, looking for this chiral phase transition. The idea is below this transition, vector mesons like the rho and the A0 are going to be different, and so we should be able to measure the rho meson pretty clearly and see a nice peak for it. But above this phase transition, they should be, at least these two should be indistinguishable from each other, and so we should see a broadening of the rho meson peak um, to the point that we may not even measure a peak anymore. 
And this is an analysis that's really done by looking at dileptons. We didn't have the statistics in BMH San 1 to really do much with this, but with BMH San 2, we probably will be able to uh, look into this systematically at a number of energies. Now, this is not the focus of my research, and I'm not the most knowledgeable about this uh, chiral phase transition. And really, moving forward, I'm going to focus on this first order phase transition because that is the uh, main focus of my analysis. So let's move on and discuss uh, the facilities a little bit. We'll start with RIC or the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, which I think most of you are probably familiar with in some respect. Um, it was really designed to search for and characterize the QGP. And with that, it has been incredibly successful. It is a pair of independent intersecting storage rings that are 3.8 kilometers in circumference. And when we run in collider mode with two beams, the center of mass uh, collision energies range from 7.7 .7 up to 200 GeV. Now the fixed target program is something new and I'll spend a little more time talking about this because I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Uh, when we run in fixed target mode, we use only one beam and collide it with our target. If we take our beam from our collider energy of 7.7 .7 GeV, that gives us a single beam of 3.85 GeV. And when we collide that with our target, it gives us this lowest energy in our fixed target range, 3 GeV. If we then take our 200 GeV energy and take just our single 100 GeV beam and collide it with our target, that gives us our 13.7 GeV energy. So we're really able to uh, collect data at a variety of energies covering the entire beam range for our collider program and have a really complete fixed target program that spans that entire energy range uh, using those beams. Now, STAR, or the solenoidal tracker at RIC, is a large general purpose detector that's great for a lot of different purposes and can do a lot of different analyses, and it has a lot of different subsystems. I'm really just going to mention the two that I use mostly, and I'm not gonna go into much detail on them right now. Uh, those are the time projection chamber, which are at the core of STAR, and the barrel time of flight, which is located cylindrically around it. Now, the time projection chamber, the TPC, is a four meter long, two meter radius cylinder that's filled with a gas, it allows us to uh, track particles, get the momentum, and uh, measure the energy loss, which is important for particle identification. Barrel time of flight also does particle identification, although it uses the timing information rather than uh, energy loss. Now, I want to mention the upgrades for beam energy scan phase two, which are the ITPC, the MCAT time of flight, and the event plane detector. The ITPC upgrade rebuilt the intersectors of the TPC. We originally had 13 readout planes and replaced it with 40, which gives us near continuous coverage. And it really improved our DEX resolution for uh, particle identification purposes. We also extended our pseudo rapidity coverage in collider mode from 1 to 1.5. And in fixed target mode, it extended us from uh, 1.5 to 2.2. Now, we see a picture here of it lit up with Christmas lights uh, right after its installation in 2019. And uh, it has been in operation since and has been incredibly successful. It's been operating well without major problems. And we have a lot of data from the ITPC that we're really excited to analyze. Next is the NCAP time of flight, which uses the same uh, timing uh, or the same type of timing information as barrel time of flight to perform particle identification, and this is located on the east end cap of STAR. It is really essential for the fixed target program because at the high rapidities of the tracks in the fixed target program, particle identification with the TPC is pretty much impossible. And so the time of flight is really the only way to particle identification, but the barrel doesn't have acceptance on the end cap. So this end cap time of flight is really essential for particle identification at high fixed target energies. Now, this was a joint venture between the CBM experiment at Bayer and STAR. They were able to test their 
hardware and software, and we've got this really fantastic detector to help us achieve our goals with fixed target program. Uh, we can see a picture here from when it was being installed in 2019 with uh, the majority of the modules uh, fully installed, although not all of them. And in 2019, we did have some problems. Um, we had some issues with uh, the electronics and some radiation damage. Uh, so a lot of the data we collected in 2019 from the ETOF really isn't that usable. But we fixed those problems, and in 2020 and 2021, we had pretty good operation of the ETOF, and we have a lot of data uh, from the fixed target program that we're really excited to start analyzing, and we should have available very soon, uh, what we've been told. <laughs> we've been told that for a couple months now. Um, the last upgrade is the event plane detector, which uh, for a lot of analyses is really used to improve the trigger and reduce the background. It is essential for uh, a number of analyses to provide an independent uh, measurement of the reaction plane uh, to really reduce autocorrelations. Um, so flow analyses um, really rely on this. It was installed in 2018. Uh, there's one on each of the two end caps, and it had to be reinstalled in 2019, which is when this picture was taken, uh, since we had to uh, do some other upgrades. Um, but the EPD has been probably one of the most stable parts of the STAR detector. It's been operating incredibly well without really any problems whatsoever, at least any major problems. Um, and it has really been one of the most reliable pieces of STAR in the past few years. Let's now take a minute to talk about star fixed target geometry, because it is very different from collider geometry. So the fixed target is located on the west end, or the west edge of the STAR TPC, uh, which places it 200 centimeters away from the center of the TPC, where collisions normally take place. The other important thing to remember is that uh, normally when we run with two beams, the center of mass frame is the lab frame. They are equivalent to each other. However, with a fixed target here at the edge and only a single beam, they are not equivalent. So we have to think a little bit differently about uh, where uh, rapidity lies within our detector and it's not so easily interchangeable with pseudo rapidity. Um, if we look at the lowest energy and we trace mid rapidity, which is where the bulk of part of production occurs, we can see it goes nicely through the TPC and barrel time of flight, meaning we have very good particle identification capabilities at mid rapidity, as well as backward if we move toward the target. We can also extend a little bit forward as well. As we go up to higher energy, we get more forward focused, and mid rapidity ends up at 7.7 .7 GB following approximately this line and going out the end cap. We have no acceptance at mid rapidity from the barrel time of flight. And while we do have some ITPC acceptance and the upgrade uh, to increase the number of readouts has been essential for this, you really don't have much ability to do particle identification using the TPC at such forward rapidity because our particle bands are just so merged together. When you, said, when you said mid rapidity, you mean in the center of mass spread, right? It doesn't, I mean, it's mid rapidity in the center of mass frame is always going to be at zero by definition if you're in the center of mass frame. So this is where we're looking in the lab frame at where mid rapidity is within our star acceptance. But when you say backward scatter, you, you, you cannot measure backward so scatter. So backward scattering. I think what you're talking about would be on this side of the right, target. Right. What we're talking about, is, or what I'm trying to say is, uh, we define the forward direction as the beam going direction. Okay. And so if you are on the beam going side of this mid rapidity line, we call that forward. And if we're on the target side of mid rapidity, we call that backward. So it's not backward scattering, because it's not scattering back in the same direction as the beam, it's just backward from mid rapidity. So it's like backward in the center of mass frame, but when we look at the lab frame, it's going forward. Exactly. 
It's just switching reference frames. So for those like labels on there, really meaning what the uh, rapidity or pseudo rapidity is, in the or for pseudo rapidity of zero in the center of mass frame, where that is in the, in the lab frame. Right, uh, approximately. So this is a cartoon. It's not exact. I haven't measured all of the angles to be perfect, but these are approximately where mid rapidity is in terms of pseudo rapidity. Now. They're not the same. Mid rapidity is going to be a little different for each particle in terms of pseudo rapidity as well as momentum. So it's not an exact one to one mapping, but it gives us at least a general idea. The heavier your particle, the worse this is going to do of describing mid rapidity. Yeah, I think what Michael is referring to is that this is beta CM at Eta lab equals 2.5, or eta CM at eta lab equals 1.5, right? Right. So the idea is at 3 GV, mid rapidity has a value in the lab frame of 1.05. Mm -hmm. And so if I just take that and say, well, instead of rapidity, I just drop pseudo rapidity to make it easier, it's approximately this line. Right. But you said uh, barrel EM cal was also used. Uh, not EM cal, the barrel time of flight. Oh, okay. Did, did you also use the EM cal for some vortexing, or that's not in the fixed target mode? No, that's not in fixed target mode. I think it is used for vertexing in our collider mode, but I've actually gone in and worked with Rosie a little bit on this, and we've modified the trigger. Um, in fixed target mode for Pico DSTs, so that it always selects the vertex that is within the target location because our vertexing algorithm has some limited resolution. There will only be one vertex within the target, and we only care about the vertex in the target. Yeah, so okay. we've gone in and basically removed every other consideration about vertex ranking and just said, is it in the target? If so, that's the one we use. Um, what this really does demonstrate, though, is that these highest energies of the fixed target program, why the NCAP time of flight is so necessary. So we can't do particle identification with TPC at such extreme rapidities. This is where the NCAP time of flight is really essential to allow us to do this particle identification. And I guess you'll show us some plots for the PID. Um, mostly with the TPC. Um, we really don't have calibrations for the NCAP time of flight completed yet. And so we don't have any plots for that. Um, we're waiting for them. And as I said earlier, we've been told they're a week away for the past two months. Um, so it's, it's coming and it will be here hopefully soon, but the calibrations just aren't ready. So we don't have but you must have simulations. So do you know what to, you're expecting for PID? Do you know what those energies between like roughly five and seven point seven? Um, I mean, we expect that we'll be able to do particle identification up to, I think it was a total momentum of like two and a half to three GV um, using the NCAP time of flight. Now, as we go to these forward rapidities that is still pretty limited in terms of PT. Um, so we do have simulations. As we get to these highest energies, we're not sure how much mid rapidity acceptance we actually will get because we have simulations, but they don't really tell us everything that we have in the end. Um, but I mean, you must have it for the three jump. Right. Yes, I mean, we have for 3GV actually. So the 3GV data set was collected in uh, 2018 before really any of these upgrades were installed. We had a single test module from the ITPC and a single test module from the NCAP time of flight that was not really operating well. Um, was, for the ETOP, that was a pretty preliminary test. Um, so, and so I'm asking whether, for example, if you're not going to show whether in the backup you have 
the time of flight versus the GPX or you know the three jet data centers for you know. Um, I do have that. I don't remember if I have it in the backup or not. But uh, as you said, I mean, you don't just make sure that, I mean, that 3G EV is using the barrel top, which is right. Easy. That's why it should. Be so you have, you have, I mean, maybe Ben doesn't because he's doing charge casual, it's not like he's saying it, but. No, I'm just I'm asking to see you know, what the, the idea is using the barrel time of flight and the GPC. But I mean, we can do talk about that. Sure. Later. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, so let's now move on to uh, the discussion my analysis, which is focusing on the charge hadron spectra at 3GB using this fixed target program. Now, the main goal of my analysis is particle identification. We want to measure the total yield of each particle in order to uh, figure out where we were on the phase diagram at uh, chemical freeze out, which is when those total yields were fixed. So we take uh, distributions of DDX from the TPC and mass squared from the time of flight. Um, I have an example of the DDX distribution here against uh, the total momentum, where we see various bands for different particles, along with uh, fit curves indicating ions, cans, protons, and electrons. And what we do is for each of these two distributions, we take slices in rapidity, m2 minus m0, and centrality. We then take each slice and fit it with one or more Gaussians to determine the yield of our particle of interest while accounting for contamination from other particles. And we see an example of this on the right here. We're trying to extract the yield of pions in this case, uh, which we can see as this sort of reddish brown curve here on the left. We also see that there is contamination from kaons in blue sitting underneath and sort of on the right side. So we need to really account for this yield of kaons and in other momentum and rapidity bins, the protons and deuterons start contaminating as well. So we need to account for them. And in order to do this, we've developed some new methods to remove the necessity for a time of flight efficiency correction by using ratios of uh, time of flight yields. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. Um, but from here, we get our particle yields, which uh, we can then use to construct our invariant spectra, uh, which we see here for protons. We've also added in a uh, detector acceptance and efficiency correction uh, based off a of model to star detector um, in JAN. And we have various rapidity slices telling us about the longitudinal distribution. And this is plotted against m t minus m naught or transverse mass, giving us information about the transverse distribution. So we have a double differential. We take fit functions and use those to extrapolate down into the low transverse momentum region where we don't have the acceptance to uh, measure. And this allows us to later on get our uh, total yield. But in this case for protons, uh, this uh, fit function we use is called a blast wave model, which is used to account for this radial flow, this expansion of the fireball. Um, and what we can do is a simultaneous fit of all of our particles, our pions, pans, and our protons with this model, uh, which has a number of parameters, but two of particular interest are the kinetic temperature and the average rate of velocity. And we keep those two the same for every particle and allow them to have different yields. And that allows us to extract these parameters or these two parameters and allow us to look at our first order phase transition, which we can do now. We can look at these same plots of the temperature and average rate of velocity that we saw before from the energy scan one. And I've now added points on these for uh, the measurements at 3 TV. Starting on the left at the temperature, we see the chemical temperature in the yellow triangle and the kinetic temperature as the uh, magenta star. Uh, I'll talk a little bit how we get this kinetic temperature later, um, or sorry, the chemical temperature later. But what we can see is these two temperatures agree with each other at 3 GeV, which 
follows the trend that we see at other energies in this region. And we also, in general, follow this trend. Now, we can see the same sort of thing at our average radial velocity, where we agree within uncertainties with this trend. The measurement at 3 GeV doesn't tell us anything on its own. What it does do is set up a systematic analysis of the beam energy scan and fixed target program data to really search this entire energy range from 3 GeV up to 27 GeV to really search for the signatures of this first order, first order phase transition, where these two temperatures start diverging and where this flattening in this kinetic temperature really begins, which may be telling us where we start forming UPPA. Are there error bars on the star? It's just smaller than the- market. There are. I've made the points a little larger to make sure they're easy to see. And by doing that, the error bars are just much smaller. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that uh, the spot at which the kinetic and chemical readouts are going to diverge tells us where it's going? Um, I mean, the idea is that the two freezeouts occur very close to each other. And at these very low energies, this is indicating that they really occur at the same time, even at the same temperature. It's also possibly indicating that we don't create QGP below some threshold, which is this sort of flat line in temperature. And we can sort of trace that down to some energy. So below a certain energy, we may not make QGP. And so these two temperatures are equivalent because they're occurring at the same time. If we have this phase transition, perhaps this causes one to freeze out earlier than the other, um, just because of the evolution of the system and perhaps um, the uh, collective flow maybe affects this as well. So if there is a QGP, you would expect that we should have some QGP. There being a I, I don't. I don't necessarily want to say that. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm not sure what we would expect about these two temperatures relating to QGP. What I do know is that this flattening of the kinetic temperature could be a signature of the QGP. I'm not, I haven't read out too much on uh, how the chemical temperature relates to QGP formation. So just to clarify, if I understood it correctly, uh, chemical freeze out is when like new particle production has stopped and then kinetic freeze out is when like even in the elastic, uh, elastic collision between hadrons also stop. So yes. I, I, so if the temperature is also an indication of when it, in time scale, which happens first, which happens later, wouldn't those two time stamps also be different just for PP? Um, or not, not that significant? Or I haven't looked into it for PP. Oh. Um, I, the other thing is it's much harder to define sort of these statistical quantities in PP collisions, you don't have as many particles. So it's harder to really define these statistically or these statistical quantities with such few particles being produced. So I don't know if anyone has tried, but it is just inherently a little trickier because of the limited statistics and not just limited statistics in terms of the size of the data set and here. Yeah, yeah, I'm just checking if I understood it conceptually. Yeah. Thank you. So Ben, mm -hmm. uh, what you haven't said explicitly, but you're clearly implying that the, the flat 
curve for the kinetic is a mixed phase. And that the mixed phase then must be two phases, one of them a proton plasma. Is that correct? Right. That is what I'm implying. I don't want to state yeah, that. That's because of the questions that are being asked. Right. The, the yes. Explicit. So the I am suggesting that this flat chemical or kinetic temperature is a mixed phase where we have a coexistence of the hadron gas and particle and plasma phase. If you're a doctor, it's not a start up. So. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I do need to be a little careful with what yeah, I'm claiming because I, I don't have any solid <laughs> evidence to back that up. <laughs> uh, all right, so we can now come back to the spectra, which we integrate over transverse mass to give us our rapidity density distribution. So taking that double differential. And uh, reducing it to a single differential. Uh, here we see it for positively charged kaons. And this gives us the pure longitudinal distribution of our particles, which we would expect to be peaked at mid rapidity and fall off as we look away from it, which is exactly what we see. If we integrate this over rapidity, we can additionally extrapolate to beam and target rapidity. We can obtain the total yield of each particle. And this is necessary for getting our uh, chemical properties, which we can look at right here. So what we do is take the yield of each of our hadrons. In this case, we've used pions, cans, protons, uh, the phi meson, cascade, and the lambda. And we put these into a statistical hadronization model, which some of you have, were discussing earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from that, it tries to change these five parameters to match the yields that we see in our experiment um, by changing the number of uh, higher resonances that it creates. Now, this was done using the uh, thermos model. There are other models, such as uh, Therminator, and we selected the strangeness canonical ensemble whatever statistical ensemble you want. Each of these choices does introduce some model dependence. But with this set of parameters, what we can see is this point at 3 GeV in red agrees pretty nicely with the trends seen from other experiments. We're sitting sort of right at the top of these measurements from the SIS energy range, the bottom of these measurements from the AGS. Um, we also agree pretty well with the theoretical uh, predictions uh, that are here in the black solid and dash lines. So this is still a pretty preliminary measurement. We haven't finalized a lot of these spectra. And we're also looking at the um, implications of including uh, light nuclei in this uh, and whether that should work or not. Um, but we can see we agree pretty well with what's expected and what was measured previously, indicating that we have a pretty good understanding of the system. Wait, what's the red marker? But there's no legend for the red marker. The red is 3 g It's oh, the new. That is like integrated over centrality? Uh, no, sorry. This is top 5% centrality. I don't know where that marker went. I thought it was in here. So is this really 3 GeV or 3.85? So it is a single beam energy of 3.85, but when you calculate the center of mass energy, the root SNM, it is 3.0. Oh. So that is actually a common confusion within STAR because we do quote things in STAR a lot of the time as the single beam energy because that's. You see Davis quotes things. No, we <laughs> quote it in center of mass. Well, we quote it in both because we know there's a confusion. <laughs> so not confusing, guys. But it's obvious. Um, we always label EB equals and then root SNN equals. <laughs> um, so yes, this is a single beam of uh, 3.85 GeV, but a center mass collision energy of 3.0. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, is this radius parameter, which has a lot of implications for QGP. 
the size of the fireball can really change the amount of suppression we see in RCP, or it could affect these dihadron uh, azimuthal correlations that we looked at earlier. So having a measurement of this size can be really helpful uh, for um, those types of analyses as well as many others. There aren't a lot of really good ways to measure it directly. So we do rely on these models, um, which are model dependent. We do have some ways to measure it though. Uh, and I'll talk about one of those now, which is uh, with the coulomb potential. So before you do that, we can go back one. I think I'm surprised that gamma S is one. Yes, I am surprised by that too. Um, I'm also surprised that the uh, quark or the charge chemical potential is a negative. I feel like my PhD said that um, SPS was way suppressed, so gamma S was less than one. Yeah, I would expect, yeah, I, I think there are some issues with this bit. I would expect gamma S to be one at LHC energies, not at Rick energies, really, let alone these lower fixed target energies. Wait, what is gamma S? Dumb, dumb question. It's the strangeness suppression factor. Suppression with respect to what? Um, the light force. Yeah. Light force. Like, have you put in as much strangeness as you That's possibly could? Uh, okay. So, if you just said there's a temperature of this, how many strange parts would there be? If you scale by this factor down. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. these numbers you're getting from the uh, bit, like the, or what, what are the numbers on the right? They're, so, this point on Oh, this diagram the is this chemical temperature and baryon chemical potential. Um, and they do come from this statistical hadronization model where we're trying to basically match these five parameters to, or take these five parameters and bury them to match the hadron yields that we measure. There's no error on the charge. In this iteration, there was not, which is another concern I have. I mean, this is a pretty preliminary study. We're continuing to work on this and we're not satisfied with the state of this now because as Helen said, this gamma S being one doesn't really make sense. This quark chemical or this charge chemical potential being negative doesn't really make sense. It should be positive since we have a lot more positive charge from the protons than we do negative charge. We don't really have any antiprotons at this energy. Right. So I, I mean, there are issues with this and we're looking into it don't have answers now. This is sort of just the most recent version of this that I have. Um, but we Can I make a comment quickly? Sure. I mean, the charge chemical potential is sensitive to the neutron proton difference. Yes. Right? And you have a lot more neutrons than protons. That is true. However, I think we still do expect it to be positive. I don't think in any of the beam energy scan one measurements, it was negative. And while we are probing a very different energy region and very different chemical potential than in beam energy scan one, I think it's a little suspect. I, I mean, and the other question I had is which centrality is this? Uh, for three GB, it's uh, zero to 5%. I don't know where the label went. I see. So it's most central. Yes, most central. And finally, um, there is a prediction for the critical point from ads -CFT calculations, that's Noronia and others, which gives it at 730 MeV chemical potential and 89 MeV temperature. Turns out right. you're very close. Yes, um, I, I did see that at Quark Matter this year, I believe. And it's very interesting. and it might indicate that our measurements from beam energy scan one for the uh, critical point from star are maybe looking in the wrong place. But the hope is with our measurements with the fixed target program, uh, we'll be able to hopefully measure it if it 
does end up uh, at these higher chemical potentials, or even if it is around, uh, I think it's 420 uh, MeV uh, for the chemical potential is around 7.7 .7 GeV. Um, we'll still be able to use the fixed target program to really help understand the baseline and the effects of, bar of uh, baryon conservation. So we don't have an answer, and there are some other interesting predictions, and the fixed target program will really help us investigate this either way, no matter where the critical point ends up being. So if I understood correctly, the prediction from this recent calculation was that it's actually a little bit lower. No, the temperature is slightly higher, 89. Yeah, so that would be slightly higher. So what's mu B? I'm sorry, I missed it. Mu B was about 730. Okay. I mean, so the arrows. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. So, when you ask about So, in your legend, you have like zero five percent and uh, thirty before E sixty eight and these kind of numbers. Mm -hmm. But um, I realize there are like also black triangles with higher up or down. Where are those? So those. So all of the colored. Well. All of the points here on the legend and this red circle are from star measurements. The black triangles are from measurements from other experiments uh, before that. So up here we have SPS energies, over here we have AGS energies, and down here we have uh, collisions from the SIS at uh, Dark Shock. Okay, and uh, I suppose uh, when you say you look at like the, the energies on the legend, so you have one data point each for like each center of the mass energy, I suppose. Um yes, and no, there's three, right? There's a three central and three. No, I mean, yeah, yeah, but, right. but like if you look at the standard, uh, the yeah. left hand side of the standard. As you go black, green, blue down and offset a little bit around the energy center. Right. Okay, cool. Maybe I just yeah, it is a somewhat involved plot. And really, my focus here is you sort of agree. We know there's some issues with some of these parameters, but we at least agree with some of them. Um, with and the trend by complication. Sorry, what? It will be fixed by complication. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> our so. We actually have plans to do sort of three separate, four separate papers um, relating to spectra at 3 GeV. One will focus on pi KP, one will focus on the light nuclei, and one will focus on strange particles, so lambda cascade. Uh, and our idea is once all of those are completed, because they each have slightly different techniques and different physics that each one can individually address, will then come together and publish a larger paper relating to these chemical properties um, with these sort of global uh, behavior of the system as a whole, as opposed to just independent okay. measurements. And so we sort of are working on finalizing those three independent papers. And then once those are done, we'll come back and work on this one. But this definitely will be fixed by the time we Okay. Um, so as I was saying, we would like to learn about the radius and the size of the fireball, and we can do that by looking at the Coulomb potential. Now, the fireball is positively charged uh, due to the initial charge of our nuclei. And in this analysis, we look at pions because they are so light, they're the most susceptible hadron to Coulomb potential, and we can measure them very easily. The idea is a positively charged pion will be propelled to a higher momentum, and a negatively charged one will be attracted back to a lower momentum. So if we do a ratio of pi plus to pi minus as a function of momentum, and we do it in terms of mt minus m naught, the transverse mass, we should see these effects, and we can then use some model 
Uh, our model includes the Bose-Einstein nature of pions, as well as an effective potential to account for the uh, momentum distribution of our protons, which are the majority of the charge in the fireball at these fixed target energies. And with this model, by fitting our data, as we can see on the right here, we can extract uh, two parameters, uh, which are the Coulomb potential and the initial pion ratio before any modification due to the Coulomb potential. And what we can do with these is first uh, just plot them against trends seen by other experiments. And we see that uh, we agree pretty nicely with the trend for the Coulomb potential on the top and the initial pion ratio at the bottom. The other thing we can do is then actually calculate the size of our fireball using this Coulomb potential. Now, if we just make a simple back of the envelope assumption to begin with, we're going to use a uniform sphere for our charge. So we can write down the Coulomb potential for that. For outside, we can just all write that down as the charge over the radius. Inside, we need to apply Gauss law and do all that fun stuff and arrive at this equation. Now, we don't want the Coulomb potential at any specific point because we don't know where any given pion was minted. We need to sort of average across the entire volume of the fireball. And so when we do that averaging, we arrive at, this is our average Coulomb potential, which we just rearrange and solve for the radius. So in order to plug this in, we need our Z part, which is just our number of participants, which we get from a Monte Carlo Glauber model, times the atomic number of gold divided by its atomic mass. We have these values, and so we uh, get our value for Z part, we have our Coulomb potential that we got from fitting the pion ratio. And I've just taken these constants and put them in some nice units. And we get a radius of 9.8 Fermi, which if we compare to our thermal model prediction of uh, 10.5 is not actually that far off. So while we know there are problems with the thermal model, this uh, parameter, this radius is maybe pretty reasonable given this measurement. Now, there are other ways to measure the size of the fireball um, using uh, interferometry, um, but that is not something I'm an expert in. Um, but wait, how is this number now larger than the R size from like HPT for 200 GeV? That's like six or something, right? Right, I mean, it, it is larger and we know that, right. um, but we've also known for a while that this thermal model radius is larger than that too. But, but the HPT radius is not necessarily the whole radius of the fireball, right? That's the correlation. That is the longest correlation. The correlation has got particles across the fireball. Okay. Strictly related to the volume. Right. It's, they're not necessarily the same thing. And as I said, this is a back of the envelope calculation. There are any number of places where we can make this more complicated. Rather than use a sphere, maybe we do a cylinder at higher energies where it's just invariant. Um, so this is a very simplistic calculation. Point here is we do get something that's relatively in good turn relatively good agreement with the thermal model. But which time frame would this radius, this one be? That's something that we don't really have a way of answering with this analysis independently. But even just from naive expectations, this is like some I mean, radius? Or this is a, we're really looking at a final state interaction. So this is going to be some final state radius. Uh, then it makes sense. So this is like a hadron gas size. Perhaps much bigger than the the Coulomb potential so is a final state interaction. It's so not in quotes. We say fireball. It's not really fireball. Right. Cool. Yeah. Take the model actually instead of box. They just say the size of the box is precisely this signal. Um. I 
don't think the thermal model uses a box. The thermal model was. The thermal model was this, where we match these parameters to the hadron, or to, or we modify these parameters to match the hadron. I don't think it actually, I mean, it, it does inherently have to have a volume, but that really comes in with this radius, which is one of the parameters it uses. Like you put white box like this. Um, yeah. Yes. Wait, so you have this R that's here, and that's from the red dot? Yes, so it's from this thermal model where one of the parameters is this radius, and that this red dot is just these first two parameters. Okay. But you get that by getting to your data. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, so like this same R data. comes from your data, and then the R that you just calculated comes from your data. Right. It's two different ways of using. So then they should agree with each other, right? I mean, they should. They're very different methods. If, as we were discussing, um, if you do an HVT analysis, you're, I mean, analyses from the AGS at similar energies have, I think, a pretty similar size for our side of around six Fahrenheit or so. And that is pretty different from this thermal model. So, so even though it comes from the same thing, the methods are so different. Right. right. There are different methods. They can be looking at slightly different definitions of the radius. Or I mean, if you come at it very naively, right, I guess, and you think of this thing as expanding, mm -hmm. like the thermal model one, which gives you the chemical, tells you when what the radius was when the particle species froze in. Mm -hmm. The Coulomb, which I'm not so sure about exactly, but you could imagine maybe this is telling you the volume at the last kinetic scattering, so that couldn't yeah. be bigger. I'm not too sure exactly what the Coulomb mm -hmm. one measures. Right, it's like an HPT more... radii measures a slightly different radius again. So they're all measuring, and none of them are necessarily measuring at exactly the same time. So right, or, or even exactly the same thing, even if they were the same time. It's not measuring the exact same radius. So, I mean, this is more of a charge radius, which may be different from the actual volume itself. So this calculation is done with pions and the other one's done with pions? Or the other one's done with all hadrons. Oh, okay. Or at least all measured hadrons. The goal is to have as many hadrons as we can get. So that gives us the best way of, or of uh, constraining all of our parameters. The more hadrons we have, the more constrained the system. Would you be able to do this with protons? Well, you can, in theory. There are, I guess, two main problems. One is this: the way this has been constructed is we use a ratio of pi plus to pi minus to oh. see the effects differently. So that's gone. We don't have antiprotons at this energy. Yeah. The other problem is this is a uh, 20 MeV chain. The Coulomb potential is only on a scale of 20 MeV. For a proton, that's really not a lot. You're not it's really going mass to, dependent. It's mass dependent. I mean, it, it's not mass dependent. You'll have the same change for everything, but it's going to be harder to notice for a proton just because of its mass compared to a pion, which is why we do this with pions. We, in theory, could do this with kaons as well, but we have the same issue, it's going to be harder to see. So Ben, are you comfortable with this error on the radius of 1%? Oh, no, I am not. Um, I think this really comes from this long potential uncertainty being so small, um, which is, I think, just a feature of the model. We haven't really properly accounted for all of the systematics. Um, this, so I guess I should also say, this is only statistical uncertainty. We don't have also, systematic uncertainty built into this anywhere. So it's if when- global, sorry, right? hmm? It's a uh, Well, the global uncertainty is for this Z part, but this Coulomb potential oh, is yeah. a statistical uncertainty. Um, and so we haven't fully, uh, 
worked on the systematics yet. So this is without a systematic uncertainty. So I guess this uncertainty should be taken with a grain of salt because of that. So I mean, I'm probably running like too much deep because we said, as you said, it's like a very simplistic model. But is like, are you very confident that like the Z on the Z part uh, that on that? Are you sure that like you can just take Z versus A of gold as is without like uncertainty? Because well, there are fluctuations, and you know there's like the or whatever. On that part. Sure. I mean, again, that's another place that we should probably do a systematic uncertainty analysis on this. Um, and we have this is just a very simplistic model that we haven't really done that much work in yet. Um, it's really based off work that was done in a recent Hotties publication um, where they followed this same sort of structure to calculate the size of the fireball. Um, and we just have not had enough time between when that was published in like, late February and court matter and now to really yeah. go through the full systematic um, calculation. It is, it's, like you said, it's like more of a little sort of naturally you think what the set of So you said you used Bose Einstein statistics for this calculation. Where does that come into the calculation exactly? So it comes in here when we do the fit. Um, if you look at this inset, this is actually the equation we use to fit the ratio. And we have these two Bose Einsteins over here, one oh. for pi plus and one for pi minus. And uh, we modify the energy by the Coulomb potential for the case of pi plus, which is in the denominator, it uh, gets shifted to a higher momentum and uh, the opposite way for pi minus. So we have different signs, but that's where the Bose-Einstein statistics come in. It's when we're actually fitting these. So we need some model to describe how pi ions are produced. And since they are bosons, they should follow Bose-Einstein statistics. The reason that you know, I, I guess like this is all like so magnetic, it seems like a very typical reason for those two models, but is the reason that the stronger actually doesn't seem to matter for this at all? I mean, it doesn't seem what to matter for this at all. It's just using I mean, so this is a final state interaction, so we don't really have free quarks or gluons. Um, we're really bound into hadrons at this point, and so there really shouldn't be really any effect of the strong interaction itself in this calculation. Um, because it really is an electromagnetic interaction. Would it be in uh, interest to look at this in other centrality ranges? Or? Yes, and that's something that we started looking at. So this is also at mid rapidity, and we're interested in seeing the rapidity dependence of this. Um, these are things that have been investigated previously and were found to be very difficult to solve problems with. Um, at the time, the AGS era, they just didn't have enough statistics to really do anything with the rapidity dependence. Now that we have higher statistics, we're trying to figure this out, but it is complicated and the effects of radio flow, for example, can potentially affect different rapidities differently. And so we're working on the rapidity and centrality dependence, but we don't have anything definitive yet. These trends are complicated. And this is probably something that would go in the sort of second paper, or I guess fourth paper that I was discussing with these sort of global system properties, because this fireball side really does relate more to the system as a whole. So we're interested and we're trying to figure it out. It's just not as straightforward as plugging it into our model. We really do want to find trends from one rapidity to the next, or one centrality to the next. And that requires some stronger constraints that we're trying to understand. <clears throat> So 
So the last thing I want to do is come back to variance stopping, which we've discussed a little bit already. Um, as I said previously, when the ions collide, the uh, protons interact with each other and lose rapidity. Uh, and so we can measure the rapidity loss by taking our proton rapidity density distribution and fitting it with two mirrored peaks that are each shifted from mid rapidity. So we have our blue peak here on the right, uh, which is our projectile participants or the beam participants. And we have this green curve on the left, which are the target participants. Uh, and we have our total sum of those uh, in the magenta fitting our data. And by measuring the shift of this participant peak from beam rapidity, that gives us our stopping, which is measured by delta y. And so we can take this and look at the trends. And we'll come back to this plot that we saw earlier, where we've added this point at 3 GeV, which follows the trend pretty nicely. The important thing we can see is as we go up to our highest fixed target energy at 7.7, .7, uh, or even higher using our collider program, we'll really be able to cover this region where we may see this suggestion of a dip that could relate to a first order phase transition. Um, and so we'll hopefully be able to resolve this tension between different experiments, especially with uh, the high statistics data sets that we have in the energy scan too. We can also look at the trends not just as a function of collision energy, but as a function of centrality. And then what I've done here is plotted the stopping against the average number of collisions per participant. What this is telling us is in our central and mid-central collisions, where this is pretty linear, it indicates that each collision is causing sort of a average amount of rapidity loss, and it's sort of the same average. And so if we fit this with a line, we can get that slope, uh, which gives us 0 0.19, indicating that each nucleon-nucleon collision causes an average rapidity loss of 0 0.19. Now, our more peripheral collisions are above this line, indicating that each collision has a larger rapidity loss. And this is not exactly a surprise. You may expect that the first collision has more rapidity loss and every successive one has less so as you get to a lower collision energy. And this is maybe what we're seeing here in these most peripheral collisions where we only have maybe two collisions on average per participant. That first collision is causing a larger rapidity loss and every successive one causes less. And once we get to our central and mid-central collisions where we have more collisions in general, this just averages out. So we're very interested in this trend, which really hasn't been studied before. There haven't really been centrality dependent studies of stopping. Uh, and we're really interested in seeing these effects as a function of beam energy and seeing how this average loss changes. And if we see the same effect of the uh, peripheral collisions having a larger average a rapidity loss per collision than our central ones. So I'll just uh, go to my conclusions. Um, beam energy scan one made a lot of progress toward understanding the UCE phase diagram. And there were a number of important results, but not enough statistics to say a lot definitively, although we do have a lot of knowledge to be gained from that program. Beam Energy Scan 2, which uh, we are working on the data analysis now, will really expand on these measurements with higher statistics. The charge hadron measurements at 3 GeV have been completed, and these really paved the way for a systematic study of the first order phase transition using the star fixed target program and the energies from Beam Energy Scan 2. We've measured the fireball size with two different methods. There is HVT that we're interested in comparing to, and we hope that someone will be completing those anal or that analysis uh, soon to provide us another comparison. Uh, and this fireball size has a lot of implications for uh, other QGP analyses. And finally, there are many exciting analyses that have yet to be completed for beam energy scan too, so stay tuned. Thank you very much.
Something on the oh no, it is. Yeah, so can you turn back to um it's like 20 something? So I was having a which slide was it? Uh maybe um, 19 or something. Uh, yeah, here. So please um explain further, like I understand how you basically get this um like PIDs back from from the species of the place, elaborate a little bit more on how you got to uh, kinetic and uh, chemical temperatures from there. So the kinetic temperature, what we do is we take this wax wave model, which um, is a combination of or an integral over two different vessel functions and some other complicated things. Um, and this construction was really designed to account for a boost invariant of radial flow. Um, and it has, I think, five parameters. Um, it has an amplitude, a mass, a kinetic temperature, an average radial velocity, and a, um, um, how do I describe that parameter? It's a, um, it's a, sort of expansion parameter that says whether you have a linear type expansion or quadratic or um, or it's the, it's the it, ex, it describes the profile of your uh, expansion. Um, and what we do is we fit all of our spectra with this same model um, and really the only so the mass is fixed by particle species we're looking at, and the uh, velocity profile parameter is fixed by just studies that we've done to find the optimal value um, that gives us the smallest chi squared. And so that leaves three parameters an amplitude, a temperature, and this radial velocity. The temperature and radial velocity are forced to be the same for every particle species, but the amplitude is allowed to be different. And so we just fit all of the particles simultaneously in order to extract these two parameters in the end. And those give us the kinetic temperature and average radial velocity that we see. And uh, what about the uh, chemical? The chemical temperature comes from this uh, type of statistical hybridization model, where we take all of our particle yields, the total yields, and plug them into one of these models to uh, figure out the set of parameters that match okay. our Okay, so this model already comes here where you were at the previous one. Right. So, yeah, this chemical temperature is really coming from this value right here. I, I had a question. Go ahead. Did you go back to your DEDX plot? the TPC? I believe it was before this. Yeah, so what are all the curves at higher PT and higher DE, DX? So these are um, what we call big so So are, are you talking about on this left plot here? Yes. So these are what we call big so curves, which are based on the beta block equation, but with some additions for um, the detector response and calibrations. And so they're really mostly from beta block and you can extend that to as high a momentum as you want. Actually, she's talking about all those different- Oh, up here at the top as you go to higher DEDX. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. these are heavier particles that we create. So we have uh, above the protons, the next band is going to be deuterons. And then we get tritons and helions and uh, I think deuteron, triton, helion, alpha, we end up getting some uh, helium-6 and lithium-6, and I think the top band that's very faint is uh, beryllium. Okay, so we're, I guess- we're a lot of white nuclei that we haven't seen uh, in these types of collisions for 20 plus years since we've done these fixed target collisions. 
That would just be your destroying star of being white. But that's on log scale. So it's. Yeah, it, the. It's the z axis, the color axis is log scale as well. So we're not creating a lot of these. And yeah. Okay. It's not going to So we can tell that it's not being piped given where the vertex is located. Yeah. I guess I was just a bit confused. I've been looking at Alice TPCD DX plots lately, and we're pretty lucky if we can get Deuterons in there. So I'm just surprised that you do have oh, this many counts. It's yeah. because we're at such a low energy. The light nuclei, the light nucleus production cross section is a lot larger at low center of mass collision energy. So I'm not surprised that you don't see a lot at Alice because you're really not having, I, I mean, a lot of these light nuclei come from the stop participants um, and I guess there are two models. Uh, one is you can create them using statistical hadronization, or the other is through coalescence of baryons into white nuclei. And if it's through coalescence, you really shouldn't see a lot of that at high energy because you don't have stop baryons to coalesce. Um, whereas at these low fixed target energies, we have a lot of stop baryons. So there are just a lot of things that can coalesce into these light nuclei. I see. Thank you. <laughs> With uh, playing the advocate of the devil, it's usually what I like to do. But um, if you go back to the slide 20 again, where we had a question earlier on 19. So you fit glass wave uh, kids. Um, you made a comment that you can't really do this in PT because uh, it's hard to define the temperature there. But if you have uh, all these spectra in PT, you can similarly fit the glass waves. You just get temperatures. You, you can, I guess. It's a little harder to justify what it actually means, though. Yes, but what in the, now you're getting at my point. So how can you use this as a signature of the Q2B while well, you can just apply the exact same as the Q2B and get you into the That's a valid point. I don't really have a counter argument to that. Um, I also don't. So. But in the, in the scenario that you think you have a PP measurement just like that. You fit it, and you get the same R. You know, yeah, you get R and you get temperature. You get chemical. You get everything. So it means that those numbers are meaningless, or all numbers are meaningless, because you try to apply it in the region where it's not valid. I mean, if, if, if these parameters are non-zero in PP, it just means you have flow between, which you know we have. I, I don't know if we can even claim that actually I can't say that. I, I mean our belief is that we do not create QGP at at least at this fixed target energy. Um, but you get temperatures yeah. And so we wouldn't expect to really see flow if we don't have QGP formation. Um, but then, but then in your next I, I mean, sure, you'll have some flow, but it's not going to be the large flows that we see. So if you just got different values from the fits in PPA versus in Terium, then wouldn't that be consistent with what we already see? It could be. Yeah. You would just get different values for the fits, like I guess lower values or whatever. Like if you do only yeah, the value you should get is sort of the. Um, I mean, um, but there is also a limit to when statistical mechanics breaks down. You have to have enough particles in your right. system to it's apply statistical mechanics, period. So that you don't, yeah. What we're saying is in PP collisions, we're sort of close to, if not below that threshold. Whereas in AA collisions, we have a large number, especially in central collisions, where we have, at, at this energy, we have like 300, uh, 300 tracks per collision. The min bias PP multiplicity is like three, 
maybe or even less. Right, and so we're okay, it's yeah, just but in the next slide. I mean, uh, all, here you do assume uh, you have globalized media that then sort of cool down again, um, and then you want to find out the, the chemical and feed out. You only have that if you have a cooling down on the thermalized medium, so it had to be confined sort of in the consumption at some point. Um, right. I mean, it, so it also conflicts. A I don't know if it needs to be deconfined to have the cooling yeah. down. You can just have a hot fire bulb that cools down. Yeah. And that's maybe what we're seeing in this region at lower energy, where we maybe never were in a deconfined state and we just started with a fireball that cooled down to some chemical or kinetic freeze out. I think Sarah wants yeah, to say Yeah, I'm a little concerned about um, the way that things are being phrased. Um, I think it's really important in this region of energies to look at things without too much prejudice. And, sure. and I want to go back to uh, Ben to your first slide, in which your first statement was that nuclear matter is a dilute uh, ideal gas. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nuclear matter right. is not at all an ideal gas. Right. I mean, we know that there are interactions. At high temperature, it is violently interacting. We call it a resonance gas, but all the interactions are in the resonances. Right. And at lower temperature, it is very strongly interacting. And if you go to any talk about neutron star mergers or the equation of state for dense nuclear matter, you find that there are tremendously strong interactions, possibly even phase transitions there. And in particular, uh, the role that thermal pressure role plays at high temperature is strongly, uh, I mean, is replaced by uh, mean fields and uh, mean potentials inside the nuclear matter. And so the way that nuclear physics or nuclear collisions works when you go down to 3G deep in, uh, the nucleon pair, uh, I, I think has to be looked at in a very different way and has to be looked at without uh, immediately questioning, uh, asking whether there is a phase transition or mixed state or whatever it is. I think it's really, um, I, I think it's really important to take into account that we know a lot more about nuclear matter at high density. Um, sure, and, I, I agree. I think we do need yeah, to analyze these in a sort of broader context than what we've been doing so far. Yeah, and so the concept that you can't have much flow uh, if you don't have a proton plasma, I think, um, I don't know whether that's true. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I think some of our measurements at STAR from 3GB have shown a non-insignificant amount of flow. And I think that is, independent of whether or not we have a QGP for it. Wait, wait, Bert, if I, if I take my, you know, min, min bias production and I introduce long range correlations without, you know, a, a fluid, I still get V2. I mean, Pythia with their ropes and strings shoving stuff gives you flow, right? Right, but I mean, we don't know whether that works quite well to describe the collision at these energies, a nuclear no, collision rather than a proton collision, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 I do agree that we need to take these results and analyze them in a broader context. Yeah, and I think the, uh, especially, you know, you, you have quite a few data at slightly higher energies. So understanding the systematics there will be really important. And I think it's really important to go with that without any preconceived, uh, you know, <laughs> prejudice. Right, and we're very interested to do that and see what these systematic trends are as a function of energy and see what they tell us about the system. Okay, we're getting very close to the two hour mark. So we yeah. Any other person? Okay, just back to that again.